And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I, uh, I enjoy reading biographies. I'm a little bit of a reader. And uh, so let me give you some of my, my reads this past year. I, uh, I got to read, you may know, I enjoy history, and so read a biography about General George Armstrong Custer of Custer's Last Stand, famous, uh, famously from there. I read, a, I enjoy Texas history, and so I read a biography about the last Texas Comanche chief, Qantas Parker. Uh, I enjoyed reading an autobiography by the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, I enjoyed some, some pastor theologian books, biographies about men who God has used in the past, R.C. Sproul and John Calvin, Eugene Peterson. But my all-time favorite in 2024, hands down, by far, was a biography of a man known as Randy the Macho Man Savage. I am a child of the 80s. You say, well, who is Randy the Macho Man Savage? Okay, WWE wrestling, WWF wrestling for older people like me, or for you like, I still have no idea who that is, fake wrestling, okay? Fake wrestling on TV, that's Randy the Macho Man Savage. And you can ask my wife, of all the books I've read this year, which book did I talk about the most, to my credit or perhaps to my shame, Randy the Macho Man Savage. And the reason why I enjoy reading biographies or autobiographies specifically is because it gives a window into the heart and soul of that person. Uh, and so that's uh, the, the events that surround him, surround that person. So Exodus is an autobiography of Moses. Uh, and, it, it, and Moses is raw in kind of who he, who he is. Like he's very, he's very honest with what he's done. Like he murders a man and he records it. Who does that? He's very honest about how he talks with God and talks to God. And it, 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 Exodus is an autobiography of Moses, but it's not just an autobiography of Moses, it's also a biography of God. It, it records the events and the stories, and by reading these events and stories, we get a window into the heart of God. And if you want an unvarnished, kind of unfiltered understanding of who God is, read the book of Exodus. For in this, in this book, you will find many, many kind of components of God. Sometimes he is fearful and harsh. Sometimes God is confusing and, and confounding. Sometimes he's gentle, but he's always loving and rescuing in those various components. Uh, that is, unlike human biographies, what do human biographies do? They're intended to inform, to even educate, to entertain. Unlike human biographies, like God's bio is intended, yes, to inform, to provide understanding, but also to, it urges us, it, it reaches out and says, you can trust me. You can trust a God who reveals himself in this way to a people like this. And so I, I titled our message this morning, Let My People Know, Hear, and Believe. And in these, this passage, there are five windows, if you will, into the heart of God. So if you're like, how, would, how does God naturally reveal himself? Well, in these various stories are the ways that God reveals himself. And the very first window into the heart of God is this. He is the God who visits his people. Uh, Tiffany started in Exodus chapter 5. I actually want us to go back to Exodus 4 and to the final five verses or so where Chris ended last week and, because it really begins there. Look at Exodus 4, verse 27. Now, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. All right, and Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord, uh, of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered all the elders of the people of Israel Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped him. It's an interesting language, isn't it? Is it not, to say that God visited his people? 
Not literally. He didn't come down out of heaven, step onto a pyramid, and then down into Egypt. Not, not in a literal sense. What does it mean that he visited his people? Well, you know that when a, a, a friend, a, a family, or church member visits you, you appreciate it, Right? Uh, the, the visit communicates what? It communicates that they value friendship, that they, commu- they value relationship. And when someone visits you but during a time of hardship or of difficulty, that means so much more to us, doesn't it? Because they, they rearrange their schedule. Perhaps they bring a meal to us to show care and concern to kind of alleviate the, whether it's the physical pain or the emotional or relational pain that we're walking through. Like when people visit us, it's a, it's a big deal. It means something to us. And so the language here that Yahweh visited the people of Israel is intentional because it's intended to communicate that Yahweh is not unaware of his people's trials. He he sees their affliction. He hears their cries. And, And when you see in verse 31 about this idea that God visited the people of Israel, the implication is this is that whenever, that God visits his people, whenever God's people hear God's words. Did you catch that? Because God does not literally come down to Egypt. So when the the nation of Israel says, God has visited us, it's the idea of this is that God has spoken. God has revealed truth to them through Moses and Aaron, which is why after Our scriptures are read every Lord's Day. The scripture reader comes to the the end. What do they say? They say, this is the word of the Lord, and we respond back with thanks be to God, right? Why do we do that? It is an acknowledgement that God has visited us through his word, and we worship him for that. In fact, throughout the scriptures, it's considered a curse when God is silent or when there's kind of, or or even the phrase darkness is used when God is silent. In fact, do you you know the very last word of your Old Testament is the word curse? And then when you take one page and go to Matthew chapter 1, when you take that one page and go like this, that's 400 years of silence where there's no prophets, there's no prophetic word, there's no revelatory word. And so when, when you see the word curse, and then all of a sudden when you, when you turn that page, it's because the idea is that God was silent. He didn't speak. And so God's visitation of his people is this, is that God has given us his word. And we're so, we're so kind of familiar with it, right? We've got like, we've got like one translation in our lap that we're looking at right now, but if you opened up your phone, you'd have like 17 more, probably dozens beyond that even. But the idea that God has spoken. And I want you to see this. Look at verse 31, or actually verse 30. Look at verse 30 where it says, Aaron spoke, what's the next word? Aaron spoke what? Oh, yeah, well, thank, uh, thank you for the one. Here we go. Let's, Aaron spoke what? Thanks for the 17 of you now. Let's try it one more time. Aaron spoke what? All. Thank you, yeah. Well, he spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. So I want to sh- show you what, what part did they actually communicate to the nation of Israel before they go see Pharaoh? So you're in chapter 4. Look back at chapter 3, verse 19. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. This was part of what God communicated to Moses. Exodus 3, verse 19. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless what? Compelled by a mighty hand. So look at, that's 3, 19. Look at chapter 4, verse 21. Chapter 4, verse 21, the Lord says to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. That is, in God's communication through Moses and Aaron to the people of Israel, it is this, I will deliver you, but it will not be easy. 
It's not going to be an easy thing. I know you've been enslaved for 400 some years. So when he spoke all that God had given to them, he included that this was not going to be an easy exodus. And so inherent in this grace life is this, that just because God visits you with his word, it does not mean that life will be easy. Do you follow? That just because God visits his people through his word, life will still be challenging to God's people. Life will still be a struggle to God's people. That Christian, when the word of God arrives in your mind and in your heart, testing and trials follow as God's appointed means to grow his children. But understand this first and foremost. You want a biography of God. God visits his people. How? Through the word. Here's the, the same, it, it, this, the kind of the second window into Pharaoh or into God is the conversation that Moses and Aaron have with the Pharaoh. And what you're going to find out is this, is that the very words that brought hope and comfort to the nation of Israel, or to the people of Israel, the Hebrews, is going to be the same word that's going to bring judgment and destruction to Pharaoh. Do you hear that? The same word that can bring hope and comfort, the gospel, God's promise of deliverance, is going to be the same word that's going to bring judgment and destruction. And it's not just true in Pharaoh's day. The gospel of Jesus Christ still has the same divide to this day, that it brings hope to one and it brings judgment to the other. I want you to see the second window into the heart of God, and it is this. It is the, he is the God who reveals himself to doubters and deniers. For the very first time in your Bible, you have a phrase that is used. It is the, it's a prophetic formula. What do the prophets always say throughout all of the Old Testament before they speak? Thus says the Lord, right? And this is the very first time that this phrase is used, but this time it's used by Moses. So look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord. Who's, yet, who's that? Moses fills it in. The God of Israel. Moses identifies. Do you remember what we said? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is God's proper name. It is the, the, the name Yahweh. He says, the Lord. Thus says the Lord. And Pharaoh's like, who's that? And Moses says, the God of Israel. And this God of Israel says to the king of Egypt, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know who the Lord is, and I will not let Israel go. Moses responds back by saying, not only are you supposed to let us go, but you're also supposed to allow us to go into the wilderness for three days, and there we will worship him. Pharaoh completely ignores the request in Exodus chapter 5, and instead he enacts harsher, harsher treatment on his slaves. That is, before the slaves were, 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 were given straw to make their mud bricks, but now he says, you, you are, you're lazy people, basically, and so now you're going to have to go harvest your own straw to create your own bricks, and you'll still have to meet the daily quota. Here's a picture of Egyptian bricks found in the uh, Museum of Archaeology in, in England, in Britain. You can still see some of the straw found in that brick, and that's actually a, a, a picture from one of the pyramids reflecting the slaves that were being used by the pharaohs um, to, to build, whether it was the pyramids or other structures. In fact, archaeologists have found actual kind of uh, brick accounts, uh, uh, a ledger board, if you would, where they unearthed the, uh, unearthed the recording that 40 Egyptians were required to make 2,000 bricks a day. And so God is 
In, in the Pharaoh who does not know who the God of Israel is, God is revealing himself to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is going to give us a window into his heart and how he responds to the God of Israel. In fact, look at verse 9 of Exodus chapter 5. He says this, Pharaoh says, Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it, and pay no regard to lying words. That is, for the person who is doubting or denying the existence of God, whether it's verbally stated or not, the heart cry is, those words that are spoken on behalf of God must be lying words. Do you see that? That if you're kind of ambivalent to the idea of God, or kind of like kind of taking a step back, that ultimately when God says, I must be worshipped for who I am and how I reveal myself to, to my people, that to do anything less than that is to actually make an accusation that God is the one that is lying. And God is going to reveal himself to Pharaoh, not just in chapter 5, but over the next 10 chapters showing that he is the true God, even of Egypt. The word is, the, this word of that the, the Israelites are supposed to not only collect the straw and make their own bricks, but the quota is still intended to be made. The word is broadcast to the Egyptian taskmasters and to the Hebrew foremen. And perhaps the, the, the it actually, not perhaps, it actually it says it just like this. It says, thus says Pharaoh, so the, the exact same type of language is being used with, with equal authority, just like, thus says the Lord, thus says Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Let them collect their own straw and still meet the daily quota. Verse 12 records that they scoured the land of Egypt and all they could find was stubble along the edges of the field because the harvest season had already come and gone and all they could find was going to the edges of the farm field and using the stubble and collecting that to enmesh in the mud and to make the bricks. And the response from the Hebrews is, is, is this, right? What's going on? Why are you treating us like this? Why are you beating us? And the Egyptians' reply is this, you are lazy. This is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. And the response from the, the Hebrews back to the Egyptians is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 20, where it says, they met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And the people of Israel said to them, Yahweh, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, God, Adonai, O Lord, why have you done evil to us? Why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. And in the response to the affliction that the Hebrews are experiencing, here's the third window into understanding the God of the Bible, and that is this, is he is the God who tests his people's faith. Their Hebrews respond something like this, certainly a good God would never allow his people to experience trials like this. And just like Many a leader, right, when, when, when people kind of complain, Moses' response is to turn back to God and say, God, you know, you promised something, but you haven't delivered. And Christian, in these two responses by the Hebrews and by Moses, right, God, if you're a good God, you would never allow us to experience trials like this. Or in Moses' case, Lord, you've promised, but you haven't delivered. Don't those responses reflect the core of our doubts and struggles? Like, God, if you really are who you say you are, I wouldn't be walking through this right now. Or, God, if you, this is the promise of deliverance, but I haven't experienced this deliverance yet. 
That is, if God, the thinking is something like this, if God isn't with us in the tragedy, right? Because I wouldn't have experienced the tragedy if he had been with us. If God isn't with me in the tragedy, how in the world can I be comforted by him after the tragedy? Is the idea. If God promises deliverance, then why the difficulties? And I just want to say to those of us, which is all of us at some point in our lives, with small, struggling faith, is that the God of the Bible is knowable, but the God of the Bible is not always understandable. You see the difference? The God of the Bible is knowable. You can know Him, but He's not always understandable. Exodus is teaching us this. God is God, and we are not. That is, Exodus is is teaching us, let God be God. Without without explanation, and we're going to get more of that as we continue on throughout the book of Exodus, like God's just going to be God and there's no explanation as to why he does what he does. And part of God's testing his people by faith is this, is that God is writing your story. And the problem is each of us wants to know how does the novel end, right? How does the story end? But just like the Hebrews in Egypt, you and I will not know the full story, unfortunately, until eternity. Like, the, we won't know at the end. And so what do we do? We live our lives open-handed, learning to walk by faith. And sometimes you can't even walk by faith, right? Sometimes you limp by faith. Sometimes you crawl by faith. Sometimes you're in a spiritual wheelchair and someone else has to push you a little bit by faith. God is testing his people to walk by faith. And so saints, I just want to say to you, though you haven't lived under slavery for 400 years like the people of of Israel, the Hebrew people, your struggles are just as real. Your doubts and questions are just as real. And God is saying, believe my words. Believe my words. But trust my words. Trust my character. Here's the fourth window revealing God, and that is this. He is the God who is faithful to his people. It's found in the first half of Exodus chapter 6. And did you know that it's not Pharaoh that will let God's people go? Look at verse 1 of Exodus 6. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God here in Exodus 6, we're, we're, going to be, we're beginning to see how God's beginning to kind of unfold how he's going to function or operate with Pharaoh. That is, God will compel unwilling Pharaoh to expel or to launch the Hebrews out of Egypt. Like irresistibly, he is going to do it regardless because God is God. God, in this next section here, God could simply say to you, he could simply say to the reader, right, I will be faithful to you. And we could have, we could go from 13 verses to one sentence, right? And have a much shorter chapter. But in verses 1 through 13, God speaks of his faithfulness with poetry and precision brought together. And over the next, I, over the next uh, six verses or so, I circled four different times that God identifies himself in my Bible. He, he begins it in verse 2, and he ends it in verse 8, and then he plants it two more times in the middle. He says things like this, I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. And he plants it two more times in, betu- in between. Not only that, 
But we have seven different statements where God uses personal statements of action. I will do this, and then I will do this, and then I will do this to demonstrate, to paint a vivid picture on the kind of a spiritual wall of our brain to say this, I am faithful to my people. Why? I am Yahweh. I always will be what I always have been. So I want us to read this. Look at verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, here's my first circle, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, like as Adonai. That's how I appeared to them. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant." Say therefore to the people of Israel, here's the second one, I am Yahweh, the Lord. Here's the first statement of personal action. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Here's the second one. I will deliver you from slavery to them. The third one, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Here's the seventh and final statement of personal action. I will give it to you for a possession. Why? Because I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. That God is faithful to his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Hebrew people, he's going to be faithful to you too. And here in Exodus 6 and 7, Israel is a picture of the believer. Not every time is Israel a picture of the believer, but here it is. And I'll tell you why I know that in just a few moments. But here Israel is a picture of the believer. That God is... Just like God delivers Israel, God will deliver you in salvation. Just as God redeemed the Hebrews, God redeems you. He is your God, and we are His people. And I know that because of some of the promises found throughout the New Testament that connect us back to Exodus 5 and 6, one of them. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 28, and I will give them eternal life and they will uh, never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Once God chooses to place people in his hand, no one, not even an Egyptian pharaoh, can take his people out of his hand. But that's not just true of Egyptian or Hebrews. That's true of people living in northwest Houston, Texas in 2024. He says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be faithful to you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That is, God is going to be faithful to his people. But we cannot determine God's faithfulness by our own definitions of faithfulness. Is this, this promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Folks, I want to ask you this question. Is that, was that verse true of a Baptist pastor's wife in the 1960s in communist Russia when her husband was placed in the gulag? You say, of course it's true. What, what about for a kind of a, a teenager in a restricted access nation who wants, to, who wants to go to higher education, but he or she can't because they believe in Jesus, and yet the promise is, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. You would say, of course that's true. And it is true of you when you get a diagnosis you don't like. It is true of you as you walk through difficulties, and you're just trying to be faithful to God. 
The promise still stands. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even to your gray hair and on your dying bed. I am Yahweh. I always will be what I always have been. And I love these, these verses I'm bringing to you because Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him, that is, in Jesus. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. This is why in the Revelation chapter 21, the second to the last chapter of our Bible, it reads, it reads like this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That is, Yahweh of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament. He's God of the people of Israel, and he's God of the people of his church. Same God, same people. Faithfulness envelops us all in Christ. Saints, God is not just Yahweh for the Hebrews, right? He always will be what He always has been for you too. This is why the Scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's faithful in the valleys, all right? He's faithful in the mountains. He's faithful in the, in the valleys. He's, he's faithful in the, the mundane, boring details of life. He's faithful when you're on 290 in a traffic jam. He, he cannot nor will not undermine his character because to undermine his character is to deny his deity. He will always be faithful to his own. And so your story is still being written, as painful as it may be. That is, you may be in Egypt, but an exodus is coming, right? And if the exodus has come, maybe you're in the desert wandering before you hit the promised land, and we understand that the promised land isn't hitting the lottery, right? The promised land is heaven itself. And so we walk by faith, trusting the I, trusting the God who says, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and my word is faithful to you. God was faithful to Joseph in the pit, in the palace, and in the prison. God was faithful to Joseph and Mary when they were commanded to travel in, to, to Bethlehem for taxation, and she gives birth to the Son of God. God was faithful to his son in Egypt, protecting him from Herod's sword. God was faithful when his son, you get this, that Jesus is about ready to experience Roman nails and a Roman whip. And yet Jesus prayed in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. God's faithfulness extends to dark garden of Gethsemane-like experiences where all we can pray is through tears of our own, God, not my will, but your will be done. God was faithful to his son on the cross. God is faithful to his church when Saul was threatening and slaughtering the church. And in the end, Revelation 19, God records that he who rides the white horse has a name. His name is Faithful and True. God is faithful. And here's a final window into God's heart. That is, he is the God who uses reluctant followers. We learned a little bit about this already with Moses earlier, but would you look at verse 9? Verse 9, it reads this way, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, all those I am the Lord's and all the things that God's going to do. And then he gave an invitation. Did you see that? And they all came flooding down the aisle and bowed their knees, right, at the front of the church. It says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. That is, they allowed their experiences to define their God instead of allowing their God to define their experiences. Keep reading in verse 10. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. 
How then shall Pharaoh listen to me, for I am of uncircumcised lips? But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Verses 14 through 28 record the, the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Would you drop to the very end of that chapter, beginning in verse 29? Yahweh said to Moses, I am Yahweh. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to Yahweh, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Uncircumcised lips simply means this. He's, he just, I have unclean lips. How, how will he listen? Like, Lord, you know what's in my past. Moses is remembering his past failures and his present fears, and he wonders, how am I going to speak on behalf of God? How am I going to be able to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt, considering my past and considering my present? And I would simply remind you, Grace Life, this. Christian, saints, I would simply remind you that God's people, of, of God's people today, usefulness to God is not based on your past failures or on your future doubts, but it's based upon your present obedience to God. Some of you are prisons to your past because like a church choir, it rises up and it chants and it haunts you. And your thought is, I could never do that because of my past. I am a person of uncircumcised lips to use Hebrew-like language. We wouldn't say it that way in 2024, we would just say this, God, I'm a mess, right? Uh, I'm a failure. And I want to remind you that your usefulness is not based upon the, your pristine past or even kind of your unwavering, unflinching faith in the future. But rather, your usefulness to God is based on your obedience to God. I don't know what steps of obedience the Spirit of God is leading you to, but I am confident that the same Holy Spirit that directed these Scriptures is the same Holy Spirit, even now, who's raising a chant louder than your past and is saying, Obey me, in this. Obey me in this. And in doing so, your obedience then, how is obedience fueled? By pure grit? How, how, how has God intended to get His people and Moses to obey over the past two chapters? He keeps, God keeps saying this, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Like six or seven, maybe eight times over these past two chapters, he keeps saying, I want you to know who I am. I always will be what I always have been. And then he fills out some statements about what he's going to do. So obedience is fueled by God himself, the character of God, and the words of God. That is, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? By the Word of God. And so obedience then is fueled based upon God's character and God's Word. It's, we could say it this way, that your obedience is fueled by God's words as you know them, as you hear them, as you believe them. And may it be so in your lives and in this church family. Let's pray. Father,